Dale, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good, thank you. I think this is the first time we've spoken with you since the announcement of the merger between the WVEA and the AFT of West Virginia. Uh, has, has anything taken place in regards to the progression of uh, how that's all going to uh, happen, Dale? Well, we're in continued talks. Uh, we are getting some, a lot of details worked out. We've got a lot more details to continue to work out. So uh, uh, we're still projecting of September 2025 for the new organization. Uh, next year, both of our governing bodies, our delegate assembly and their convention, assuming that we continue on the pace we're on, will uh, our delegates will vote on uh, the adoption of the merger, and then we'll go from there. Okay, very good. Have you settled on a name yet, or is that still in the negotiation process? No, no, we, we are doing uh, uh, a lot of polling. We'll be polling. Easy come, easy go in this business. Dale, do we still have you? Yeah. Okay, there you are. Yeah, we lost you for a moment. You said you're going to be doing some polling to to find a new name? Uh, yes, yes, and, and got exactly what we need to do. Uh, so, uh, you know, we'll let the members uh, decide the direction they want a new organization to go, things that are important to them. Of course, uh, right now we're calling it the West Virginia Church Organization. Yeah, this, uh, I, I, I'm guessing you're driving somewhere, Dale, because we're, we're, you're going in and out. Uh, I should be okay in about two minutes. Give me a second. I'm sorry. That's not a problem. Bill has been wanting to talk about Amtrak for a while now. So, <laughs> All right. but, drive, take your time, Dale. I have a lot to talk about. Dale should have taken the train. He, you should be on the train right now, Dale. Yeah, so, I, I drive. Really, I really should. <laughs> hey, I want to ask you about uh, the recently completed. Speak, yeah, go ahead. Speaking of trains, back back in the early part of the 1900s, uh, when Bramwell, where I started my coaching career uh, uh, had more millionaires per capita than anywhere in the world at that time mm -hmm. uh, each of the coal owners would have their own railroad car and the trains would come and pick the car up and, and take them to New York or wherever they wanted to go so that they still have a, a train car down there that that you can you can actually uh, Look, it's not one of the ones that the coal owners had, but uh, it's still a big part of the history of Bramwell. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, Dale, with your influence, could you perhaps get one of those private cars moved up here and Rob could use it going back and forth to work each morning <laughs> and the rest of us could use it to go for go out for lunch? No, 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 no. I don't want you peasants using my luxury <laughs> railroad car. You, you, know, you know, with my influence, we may have to go to the model train store, and I might could buy you one like that to go with my employer. Oh, he's too uh, modest, Bill. He's too yeah, modest. Yeah, come on, Dale. I've, I've been... they, would, they would probably charge me double, but, but yeah. I, could, I could see what I could work out. I, I think you're being too modest, Mr. Dale. Dale, let's talk about this recently completed legislative session. I know there were some folks on the Education Committee who were disappointed that the discipline bill from Amy Grady uh, didn't get through the House and ultimately get signed by the governor. Uh, what were your thoughts on that education bill? Would you have liked to have seen something passed, if not that exact bill? I, I would have liked to have seen something passed. I've, we've said, I've been saying for a year now, uh, I, I look back at, at some of the, we have a state board meeting at 9 o'clock today that I'll be speaking at, and I look back at some of the remarks that I've had in the past, and I've been saying all year that we really have to deal with the discipline issue, the mental and emotional state of these students, because if we don't, uh, it doesn't matter what we do reading and writing wise, if we don't address these issues, they're not going to be where they should need to be. Bill. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Dale. Uh, by my count, approximately 30 bills that dealt with education has been was passed and signed by the governor. I 
suspect of those 30, some you very much agree with, some you do not agree with. Uh, one in particular stuck out to me, and that's Senate Bill 487, which requires review of professional development for teachers and educational staff. Uh, currently, that was every 10 years. Now it's been reduced every five years. Uh, what was the, uh, the genesis? What was the emphasis for that particular bill? Is well, it, that, it that's, needed? that's a good bill in that uh, the legislature over the years have mandated different staff development, so to speak. Uh, one of them would be a suicide prevention, which is very important. But it's the same video year in, year out. You know, if you're not changing things, why do I have to watch the same video year in, year out? Uh, let's let's update things. Let's make sure that we are aware of what's going on. But staff development should be a, a school-based decision, not mandated from the legislature like they're continuing to do. Each school should know what they need and how they need to improve and, and the things they need to help their students, not... Uh, not just uh, the legislature making that. But but this is a good step in that you're reviewing it and making sure that things are relevant and things are updated. Yeah, uh, you say each school should do that. Does every school do that, though? Is there, isn't there a need well, in places to you, ensure that? Parents? You really don't have the option to do that because the, the legislature now has mandated so many staff developments that uh, – uh, you know, you, you don't have the option to, to make it fit what, what you need at your school. There's another bill that did not pass, and that was House Bill 4851, uh, which would, allow, would have allowed public and private schools in West Virginia to employ former police officers as school security personnel. Mm -hmm. Did you, uh, uh, was that, does that bill have merit? Well, yeah. You know, there had been a push in the last three years to to have more people armed in the school. Uh, I, I'm not a gun person myself. I understand that most West Virginians are, and, and I respect their right. Uh, but, but earlier in the year, in November, I was at a national meeting in Atlanta, and we had a, a lady there that's a teacher now that was a 20-year combat veteran. And this issue came up about arming teachers. And and she explained that when she was in, in the military in combat, she was trained to shoot the enemy. And her mind allowed her to do that, and, and she was trained to do that. It's a different mindset when that so-called enemy now is a former student and uh, we've had police chiefs we've had state police we've had a number of people who who have uh, spoken in committees and talked about uh, number one in a crisis situation like that uh, you you come in and and how do you know who has the gun how do you know is the person there with the gun is is the one creating the issues or not uh, I, for for uh, security officers and things, yeah, I, I, I can see that. Uh, but but arming a bunch of people in the school, we again, I go back to we have far more students each year commit suicide than than uh, are in school shootings. And I would hope another school shooting never ever happens. I mean, we need to do everything we possibly can protect our kids, to protect our staff, and make sure everybody's safe. The school should be the safest environment of all. But again, we're not dealing with the mental and emotional issues of the students. If you look back at the school shootings, most of the time, they're a former student. And that's why I continue to say we need to address these mental and emotional needs of these students. Uh, if we're, we're doing that, then that could help uh, cut down on, on the school shootings and things like that, too. 
Yeah, Dale, uh, that is a very convenient thing to say. I've heard it uh, repeated by many, many times. Uh, but a couple of questions, Juan. Uh, how would you identify the population that needs a special training? And second, how much? How, what is the cost? Is it is it reasonable or is it prohibitive? The the training for who carries the, the, for, the for, weapon. Yeah, for the one recognizing there's a mental problem within a particular child and it could come back and do harm to the school. One, how, what is the screening process that would be reasonable in recognizing this population, and do you have any idea at all how much it would cost? It is going to have a price tag to it. There's no question about that. I, I go back to 2011, 2012, the an innovation zones project that we had, pilot project we had in five counties that put an alternative setting in the elementary school. And that's where you need to catch these kids. You need to address these issues in the elementary school and, and start working on them in the elementary school. If you wait till they're middle or high school, you, you, you've lost a, a lot of kids. But but you could pull a disrupt. You, you can tell when kids are disruptive. You can tell when kids are, are acting out doing things like that are being violent uh and and work on those things that, that are causing that that violence uh and and again it, it does have a cost to it but i would think that if you could start to identify those kids and work on those issues and help those kids at, at a very early age uh it, it's going to help them throughout their academic career and it's going to help the rest of the students and that you're removing that major disruption from the classroom that's causing the other students not to be able to to have the full uh, attention of the, the educators. Matt Miller. Dale, let me ask, when you talk about, you know, catching these things in, in the lower levels, the elementary school levels, um, recently the bill was passed to have teachers' aides, especially in that, that early time, first, second, third grade. We've now had a couple of years to, to have that implemented and that process beginning. Um, what do you hear from teachers? Is that making a difference? It, it is. An ex always an extra set of eyes is, is very important. It was implemented in the first grade this year. Next year, it goes into the second grade. Uh, the issue is finding the people to do that. Again, we had 1,705 positions across the state of West Virginia teaching positions without a certified teacher in it. We've had first grade classes that have had five and six substitutes uh, throughout the year. We've had uh, aid positions that, that are, are not filled in, in that uh, category so finding the people to do that and, and until we address that number one we make the the, the profession attractive to students we saw a 14 percent decrease in the number of students entering education in our colleges and making it attractive to stay in west virginia making it competitive making us competitive with the contiguous states then uh, you know we we can have wonderful programs. So if you don't have people to implement it, it doesn't help you. Talk to us a little about the recruiting process for teachers. I'm sure this is that time of year. You've got to be thinking about that. Teachers perhaps talking about retirement or or maybe talking about sure. just kind of getting worn out and they may leave. But also colleges and universities graduations are coming up. So what's that process like for you? Well, uh, you know. I, I really think that teaching is a calling. I mean, you, you, you have a calling to want to make a difference for students and, and, to, and to help them succeed in life. Uh, and, and while uh, nobody goes into teaching to get rich, you shouldn't be, have, be on the poverty lines either. So we have to make it attractive to when for students who are now saddled with huge amounts of, of uh, college debt, loan payments, uh, to, you have to make it attractive for them to come into education. And, and we, I, I, I think we're, we're doing a good job now. We're starting to identify students in high school with our Grow Your Own program that uh, want to be teachers and may be good teachers and giving them the opportunity to get some of these courses while they're in high school to help alleviate that uh, long-term debt. 
Dale, we, we hear quite a bit over the last couple of so years we've uh, been responsive to the needs of the teachers by giving pay raises. Yet I look across the state line in, uh, in Maryland, and they're doing a significant revamping of how they, uh, how they uh, pay, also reimburse the teachers for various needs. Uh, there was a discrepancy already between the two states that gap is going to become progressively wider. I cannot oh, speak yeah. to Ohio and Kentucky, but at least in the eastern panhandle, the challenge is going to be even greater. What is being done to look at this existing gap and anticipate the future gap, which is going to be significantly larger? Well, we've, we've uh, received pay raises in, I think, four of the last five years. And we're still in the the bottom 40 in the nation in pay. Uh, and as you said, when when Maryland and, and Virginia and these other states surrounding us are making higher increases, uh, why would you not drive 30 minutes if you are saddled with uh, uh, hundred thousand dollars student loans to to make the more money? So. We, we have to address, make it attractive to stay in West Virginia. We have to address the, the salary issue. We also have to address the, uh, the benefits, the insurance, the uh, retirement, and things like that. Uh, and I, I continue to say that uh, one of the answers for the problems in the Eastern Panhandle is uh, a continued reduction in the, the local shares. Let let the Eastern Panhandle and all of our counties in the state keep more of your local tax dollars, but designate those toward salaries and benefits. Uh, if you if you give counties the ability to use them any way they want, you had some the last time we did that um, uh, repair roofs and things like that. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're saying that we need to keep our people, make our salaries uh, competitive, then use that to to make them competitive dale how would that's something that can pass yeah dale how would you rebut the uh the problem or the uh, claim that we're giving adequate amounts to the schools uh or to the teachers but it's been misdirected it's going to the administrative side as opposed to drifting down to the teachers themselves well one of the things you'll continue to hear different politicians say is that uh we're in the top 15 in the nation in the amount per pupil expenditure, uh, which if you look at the actual dollars, that may be true. But what, what they're not telling you is we're one of the few states that have a statewide retirement system and a statewide health insurance system. Most of the uh, states around us do that uh, local by local. Secondly, we are paying for the sins of the past. We put more than $400 million a year into the retirement system to make up for the years that we didn't put anything. If you remember in, in 1990, uh, the, the teacher strike in 1990, the retirement system was broke. I mean, it was the worst funded retirement system in the nation. Uh, the WVEA filed a lawsuit. The courts mandated that the legislature and the governor would have to put money in a 40-year plan to pay off the retirement system. Uh, that will be paid off in 2034. We went from the worst-funded retirement system to one of the best-funded retirement systems in the nation. But all of those count as education dollars. When you're looking at the actual dollars that go and get to the classroom, uh, we're probably around 34th, 35th in the nation in per pupil expenditure. Dale, tell me about the W. Oh, sorry, the uh, PEIA increase for this year in terms of what the percentage has been and what you're expecting for next year. Well, the the uh, shopper's guide is out now, so I've been able to look at, at the increases, and the increases range anywhere from for a single plan in the lower tiers, uh, 7 to $10 a month, to the highest plan uh, average, it, it's it's less than seventy dollars a month. Uh, so, uh, you know, people will see the twenty four hundred and sixty dollar raise. People will see some of that raise coming into their into their paycheck this year. 
Now, there's always going to be an exception. You you could uh, uh, this raise could bump you into a different tax bracket. This raise could bump you into a different tier of, of PEI and things like that. But but for a general statement, is uh, uh, you will see some increase in your in your pay. And when you said uh, seven to seventy dollars a month, you don't mean the health care premium. You mean the increase in the premium. The increase in the premium, yes. Increase in the premium. Okay, correct. Yeah. And what are, what are you expecting for the next school year? Has that been revealed yet, or is that where you just addressed? Were you talking about the no, current that, school year or next that, year? That 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 will that will go into effect July one. July one. Okay. Yeah. The raise that was passed. Does everybody yeah. get five percent, or is that a pool of money that gets redistributed to the beginning teacher salaries more so than the ones who are at the higher no, end? It's, it's a it's a twenty four hundred and sixty dollar across the board raise. It's everybody got that five percent. Yeah. So everybody gets twenty four hundred sixty dollars. Yes. All right. I and and one hundred forty dollars a month for service personnel. Okay. Hey, I've got about uh, a minute left or so. Do you have a uh, Coach Dale Lee story you want to <laughs> let us know about before we say goodbye? Uh, this is a sentimental story. My first year coaching, I was at, at Bramwell High School. We're in the uh, state tournament. We're, we're undefeated at that time. My oldest daughter uh, was about to turn one years old. And we left on a Tuesday. And on Tuesday, she was pulling up and trying to walk and things like that. Uh, uh, we played. We won on Wednesday and played again on Friday. And her mom brought her to the game on Friday. We're on the court warming up. Uh, she, her mom brings her down to the, the, call, the Civic Center floor, sets her down on the gym floor, and I'm standing there at the bench. And she walks over to me. The first steps I ever saw my oldest daughter take were on the Civic Center floor in the state basketball tournament. I never go in that that Coliseum, I never see that gym floor that I don't see this little one-year-old girl walking toward me in the first step. So, so that's uh, that's an experience that that I will never ever forget and and relive every time I, I see that. That's a nice story. Were her first words, "Ref, how did you miss that call?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, she her first words were, "Mama." But she said coach before she said that. Oh, that's pretty <laughs> cool. Hey, who wouldn't love that, right? Yeah. Uh, Dale, thank you very much, man. Good to talk with you. All right. Thank you. Take care. And uh, we appreciate that his cell service did improve like he said it would as he yeah. moved along there.